Well, I see I'm down to give the message this morning. <laughs> We've had a real festival of music today. So in conclusion, <laughs> let me just say this. Actually, there, there is one little music lesson I'd like to leave with you. Um, I, in looking over my life, I realized that I write a little bit of music, and I, I write it because I can. But I never really desired to be known as a composer or an arranger or anything like that. But it's something I discovered I could do, and so I do it. But it's not the big majority of my life by any means. At my uh, root, I'm a teacher. I love to teach. And so uh, I just wanted to share with you a, a little musical concept today. Uh, I can tell you this, and I'm going to tell you a couple of things today that you're going to go away saying to yourself, that didn't make any sense at all. And I'm going to point out a thing uh, from the Bible that makes no sense, and I'm going to point out something from music that makes no sense. And yet, for some reason, I feel compelled to share it with you. So, there's a couple things you need to know about music, and especially about melody and with songs. When music is put to words, uh, often the melody illustrates what is said. So, for example, if you take the chorus, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. You wouldn't sing, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. It makes no sense for the melody to go up when we know it's, I've got the joy. The words just dictate that the melody has to go down. That's what we call text painting in music, when the music paints uh, an acoustical picture of what the words are saying. Sometimes um, music is used to, with sound to describe what is seen. So, for example, um, Ernest Rance, Colonel Ernest Rance, uh, from the UK. Uh, one time he was specialing, he was doing a weekend, I suppose, such as this. Actually, it was longer than that. I think he was, he was away for about a week, and he was up in Scotland. And he was uh, staying at a place that looked over the Ock Hills. And I'm told the Ock Hills are north of Edinburgh. And uh, during a short stay, um, his room overlooked the Ock Hills. And Although the colors changed with the time of day, the profile remained the same. And so he was inspired to trace the profile onto the five lines that we know as the musical staff. And then he wrote a tune to fit the contour of those och hills. Now, sometimes the note would linger for a while because the peak would go that way and then it would go high for a little bit and then come down. But if you close your eyes when I play this little tune, I think you can see a profile of the Ock Hills. Just listen to this. Can you see it? Can you see the line? And he attached to those words, which are really just a uh, paraphrase of Psalm 121 that says, I, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. And so he wrote, to the hills I lift my eyes, the distant hills before me. Hills that rise to reach the skies and spread their glory o'er me. Planted by omnipotent hand, by divine appointment, they stand. To the hills I lift my eyes, the beckoning hills before me. So the music really is portraying what he sees. Now sometimes music can depict a mood uh, described in the text. Uh, for example, uh, years ago I wrote a song and the first is about tension, conflict, unresolved things of life. 
and it, it does something like this. Often I come with my problems and cares, running to you when distressed. But I must bring you the whole of my life. Lord, I must give you my best. And then it resolves. Sing with me. All that I am, all I can be, all that I am, I So you see how the music sort of resolves as it comes to that chorus. And it was at a time of great tension in my life. My wife was in chemotherapy in a hospital for a month at a time. And it coincided with our big, the equivalent of your national music camp, our Central Music Institute, and I was in charge of it. And I'm driving back and forth every day, getting the camp started, driving down to Chicago, spending time with Wendy in the hospital, then driving back for the evening program every day back and forth. And in that back and forth, I'm thinking, what do I have to say to God about this? What do I have to say to him about this? And uh, Sunday morning, about 4 o'clock in the morning, which is not my time, I'm a, I'm a night person, not a morning person, but I woke up and the words of that chorus were fully formed in my mind, all that I am, all I can be, all that I have, all that is me. It resolved. And I jotted them down on a piece of paper. I made a copy for the pianist, and we taught it to the kids at, at church that morning during our worship service. There are two Sundays in our camp, and the second Sunday I actually had it printed up. And uh, if you know anything about camps and paper, there are a lot of trees die for our programs. We, <laughs> we print a lot of paper, and often we collect it and throw it away at the end of the meeting. But, you know, after that meeting, there was nothing uh, on the chairs, nothing on the floor. The kids all took it with them. The staff took it with them. And they sang it all over the world. But that tension is released when you get to that, that chorus. Now, I want to explore a hymn tune with you that makes no sense whatsoever. First of all, it violates all the rules of hymn writing. It has no pattern or desirable, discernible shape. Now, a pattern would be like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. You know, you have the... Then it has a sort of a B theme. Then it goes back to the A theme. Very discernible, very obvious. But this tune, and I'm referring to the tune Sagina, makes no sense whatsoever. It, it has a range of like 14 notes, way too much. The late great Sidney Cox resided in an in a elder care place that I worked at when I was 14 years old, and I had a coffee break with Sidney Cox every day, and we talked about songwriting, and he said, Billy, just remember the three S's. Keep it sensible, scriptural, and singable, and try to keep it in an octave if you can. And I took his advice. But this tune, you know the tune is like, uh, oh, it's too high. That's too low. <laughs> I'll go back to this one. I only play in two keys. Okay, 
so that's the A theme, then it goes to the B theme. Then he goes to the C theme. goes to the D theme. Breaks all the rules. A, B, C, D. There's no rhyme or reason to that tune, and yet it's a great tune. It's a great tune. And Charles Wesley uh, wrote this song that also doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? He wrote this on the f first anniversary of his conversion. Interesting thing about Charles Wesley, he was the youngest of 23 children. Poor Mrs. Wesley. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. But. The theology makes no sense because it's based on God's grace. And if there's something that makes absolutely no sense by our human way of reckoning, it's God's grace. Think about it, like when the flood came in Genesis, Noah built the ark, all mankind except his close relatives were destroyed. And God finally lowered the waters, the ark landed, and it says in Genesis 8, 20 and 21, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans. And get this, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So he made that covenant with us even though he knew we were still going to screw up because we're humans and our inclination is evil. How about Isaiah in that 53rd chapter where it says of Jesus in prophecy, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, like that was on him, had nothing to do with us. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. Does that make any sense at all? I don't think by our standards of human uh, reckoning, it does. Or that classic key verse in Ephesians, in the New Testament, Ephesians 2.8, where it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works, not by anything we can do, so that no one can boast. See, grace doesn't make a lot of sense. Even earlier in Romans, Paul said, you see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Does that make any sense at all? I don't think so. And yet, like that tune, it's beautiful. It's something we can hang on to. It's something we have to claim by faith because we certainly aren't deserving of God's goodness. So when Wesley writes, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? I tried to do like a Eugene Peterson thing, you know. He, he did the Message Bible where he, he didn't translate it, but he paraphrased it in ways that would help him better understand it. When I translate that verse, it doesn't have any poetry to it, but it says, is it possible that I could care about Jesus, that I could understand his death, especially when I was the reason for it? 
Amazing love, it makes no sense that God, now my savior, would die for me. Or when he says he left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, and emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. I think Jesus left his power and authority in heaven willingly with immeasurable grace, giving up everything but his love. He died for his helpless children. Now that's mercy for all with no strings. Praise God, it found even me. So goes the paraphrase of Charles Wesley's uh, verses. Now why all this discussion of grace amongst believers, amongst uh, Christians? Because in any church we can be very process oriented. Sunday, time to go to the meeting. It's Wednesday or Thursday, time for band practice. It's time for junior soldiers. It's time for senior soldiers. It's time for this, it's time for that. All these groups that are really great and very um, well focused in what they do. But if we come through uh, this process without internalizing it ourselves, we're just people going through a process. My wife was a zero generation salvationist uh, and she uh, came to the Salvation Army because her business teacher at high school uh, was a sergeant major of his corps. And she took all his business classes and he could see that she was pretty sharp and he, being the sergeant major, needed a babysitter because he and his wife were always down at the core, so they needed help with that. So they hired Linda as the babysitter, and eventually she uh, went down to the core uh, a few times and really liked that. Her family were completely non-believers. Her father was an alcoholic. The last time she saw him, she was six years old. And she found in this core a home and a community of faith. And she loved it, and she embraced it, and she became a soldier, and she wore the uniform, and they made her the YPSM, and she did a great job at, at that. And she's now 33 years old, and she's at our Bible and Leadership Institute uh, uh, territorial camp that's held every year for about nine days. And while she was at that camp, she heard someone preach on the idea that you can go through all these things, but until you have consciously asked for Jesus to have a relationship with you, you're incomplete. You see, she hadn't done that. She'd done all the process, and she'd done all the good things. She'd been really involved in, in her works, but her faith had not been ignited yet. And it was that day, at the age of 33, that she came to this altar, this penitent form, and she asked Jesus consciously into her life not just the historic figure or the reason why people were doing all these good things in her core, but she wanted his voice in her life. She wanted his presence. You see, she was a child of process, but eventually had to come face to face with her Lord one-on-one. -on -one. So that's why I share this, because we can all go through this process. But there might be someone here who hasn't actually made that decision. This wouldn't be the Salvation Army without at least inviting you to do that. Now, we're going to sing this great hymn of the church, and we're going to wrap it up with that. But perhaps we could sing that chorus once again. And I'd want to open it up. If somebody has not done anything more than the process and has never invited the person into your life, perhaps this is your time. This is your day. I'm gone at 6 o'clock. I hope if Air Canada comes through. It's dodgy coming in, I gotta tell you. But this could be God's moment for you. And I wouldn't want you to miss it. Could we just sing that chorus? All that I am, all I can be.
spoken to a heart today that is not in relationship with you, that they'll reach out in faith, claim your grace, which makes no sense, which we don't deserve, but you give us freely in spite of ourselves. And Lord, for those of us who've been on the way and on the road and following you, I pray that you'd help us this day to continue to be more like you and less like us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing Charles Wesley's great anthem celebrating his conversion to faith? So be led by the band and I'll bring you in. <laughs>